This is Luke chapter 11, verses 45 through 52. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed, so you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perish between the altar and the sanctuary. And yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. So, if you were to look at over the last 25 years and how our world has changed, if I were to ask you that question, how has the world changed in the last 25 years, many of you would, would cite technology. The, inva- the advancements of technology over the last 20 fe- 25 years have been huge. And some of the advancements that we've seen between 2000 and 2005, we had Facebook and we had YouTube. And now, as of 2023, there are over 2 billion users of Facebook and YouTube. And if you go a little bit further, if you look at the use of the internet, the number of internet users that we have right now worldwide are 5 billion. And Forbes did a study, and they expect that number to grow to 7.9 billion by the year 2029. That's the number of users of the internet. And then we have over 1 billion websites. And that was a statistic from 2023, so we know that number has grown. So, and then we don't forget that in 2007, it was the invention of the iPhone. And it put all of this information, all of this technology at our fingertips. Access to the internet, access to apps, social media, all of it's right there at our fingertips. And so as we look at all this information that we are bombarded with day in and day out, the obvious question that we as parents and others ask about ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, is how do we protect ourselves from information that we don't want our kids to be involved with, we don't want ourselves to see, and that started... That started the the use of content filters to kind of filter out that information that that we just don't want to be a part of. What's happening in this passage is Jesus Christ is actually having a conversation with the Pharisees and scribes, and the point of that conversation is to protect both the purity of the gospel and the message, the people who are hearing that message. He's protecting the purity of the gospel and the people who are hearing that message by calling out these false teachers and their false message. And unfortunately, in the church, in the church worldwide, we have false teachers and we do have false messages. And so we have to ask the question, how do we protect ourselves? How do we protect ourselves from false teachers? How do we protect ourselves from false teaching? And when we look at this text, there's three questions that kind of rise up out of it. The first question is, does this person's teaching line up with the words of Scripture? The second question is, do the qualities of this person's life glorify the Lord? And the third question is, does this person preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Those are the questions that we're going to be looking at so that we can answer the question, how do we protect ourselves from false teaching and from false teachers? So we look at this first question, does this person's teaching, does it line up with Scripture? And to see that, we look at verses 45 and 46. 
In verses 45 and 46, you have this first woe that Jesus goes into with the, with the scribes, these experts in the law, these interpreters of the law. And Jesus says to them, for you weigh the people down with burdens. And you weigh them down with burdens that are too great for them to carry by themselves. And the burdens that they're being weighed down with are these burdens of these man-made interpretations of the law. He's not talking about, Jesus is not talking about the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. That's the word of God. But what these scribes, what these experts in the law were actually doing was they were, they were coming up with man-made interpretations and traditions of the elders that had been passed down, and they were putting them on top of God's word. And they were requiring obedience to them more strictly than they would the word of God. And we actually know how God feels about adding words to his word. Adding words to his word and and obeying that more than we do his word. And he says this in Deuteronomy 4 verse 2. Do not add to what I command you. Do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. And then again in verse 6, same chapter, keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. In other words, what the Lord is saying here is your wisdom and your understanding of how to grow closer to the Lord, of how to live the Christian life, it's not going to come from these man-made interpretations that are on top of God's word. You don't have to look to those. The only thing you need to look at, the only thing that you need to understand are the commands that I've given you are the commands that I have given you to obey. That's what you need to pay attention to. That's what you need to keep and observe in order to grow closer to the Lord and live the Christian life. Proverbs 30 verse 6 says, Do not add to his words lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. The adding of the man-made interpretations and the traditions of the elders on top of the word of God was something that these scribes, these experts in the law, were doing. And the obedience that they were requiring was actually to achieve some religious purity. So in other words, they're saying, look, in order for you to achieve religious purity, in order for you to become closer to God and find favor with God, you need to obey these things, and you also need to obey these, these interpretations of the law. And so what we know about these Pharisees and these scribes is that they were actually pushing what is a false religion. They're pushing a works-based religion instead of a, relig- a religion that is based upon the work of Jesus Christ. That's what these men, these scribes, these experts in the law we're, we're, we're pushing on the people, but there's more to it than that. Not only did he say you weigh them down with burdens too great for them to carry, but he said, look, you yourselves don't touch these burdens with your own fingers. And what that simply means is this. You're not willing to do the very things that you're telling the people they need to do. In other words, you don't practice what you preach. And you as experts of the law have the ability to remove these oppressive man-made interpretations from the people, and you don't. So not only are you pushing a a false religion, you are not practicing what you preach. This is the false teaching that these men are requiring of the people of God. And we have to guard against. Jesus is calling them out, trying to guard the message, the purity of the message, and the people who receive that message. One of the things that we do in both children's ministry and youth ministry is we are constantly recruiting volunteers for many different, for many different jobs. We're, we're always recruiting volunteers. And the thing that we have to do, that we do at least two things, we sometimes do more, But the first two things that we do is we have a conversation with that person. We want to understand, what is your faith background? Do you know the Lord? What's your devotion life like? I asked someone 
a couple of weeks ago, I said, how would you explain the gospel of Jesus Christ to an 11-year-old? And then we have them sign this piece of paper. They read this piece of paper and they sign the bottom of it. And it's the essentials of our faith, both what we say in this church we believe as well as the EPC. It's what we believe about Jesus Christ, about God, about the, uh, our salvation, not being of works, but, but by, by grace through faith. It's the essentials of the faith. And we have them sign this. We do all of this for one reason. We want to protect the people who are receiving the message. And that's what Jesus is doing in this text. So for us to protect ourselves from false teaching and false teachers, we need to ask the question, does this person, are they teaching, does, does this teaching line up with Scripture? The second question we have to ask is, do the, do the qualities of this person's life, do they glorify the Lord? And you're going to see this in verses 47 through 51. John Piper calls this the fruits test. And so what's happening in, in verses 47 through 51, and we won't go in depth into it, but what I want, what I want to highlight are just a few things. What, what Jesus is doing is he, he pulls back the layers of the onion to let us see who these men really are. These experts of the law, these interpreters of the law, who are they really? And he begins to describe them. He says, they are descendants of those who killed the prophets. In other words, they're directly related to the men who killed the people who came to tell people about the Messiah. The very people who were sent by God to tell people about God, these men killed them and you're related to them. The second thing that he tells them is he said, you are, you are erecting monuments over their graves. And of course, the, the Pharisees and the scribes thought that this was some big thing where they get to honor the dead. And that's kind of, that's the life they portray. That's what they want people to believe, is that they're honoring the dead by building these huge monuments on top of the graves. When in reality, what we actually know is they weren't trying to honor anybody. They were, they were trying to give this kind of false honor to the people who were killed, the prophets who were killed, when in reality what they were doing at that very time was planning the death of Jesus Christ. That is what was in their heart, and Jesus knew it. So you have these men peddling a false religion, giving a false message, and they have false motives. And Jesus goes further, and he says in Matthew 15, he calls them hypocrites. He says, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. These men that we're dealing with, these scribes, these interpreters of the law, they have a false religion they have false motives, and they have false worship. And if that is not a long enough resume for you to figure out, okay, who am I dealing with? Are they, are they the people who are going to reflect qualities that glorify the Lord? If that's not enough, you could turn to Matthew 23 and see this similar interchange happening where Jesus calls them hypocrites six times. And not only does he call them hypocrites, but he says the motive for what they do, for why they do what they do, is that they love the best seats in the synagogues. They love to be seen by others. They love the place of honor at meals. And they love to walk down the street and be called rabbi. That's what's in their heart. And again, if that's still not a big enough checklist for you to see kind of who, who these men really are. Jesus says inside they are full of self-indulgence. They are full of lawlessness, greed, and uncleanness. These are the religious leaders. These are the, these are the scribes, the interpreters of the law. And so we ask that question, do, do the qualities of their lives glorify the Lord? And so the application for this 
is for you and me, we have to ask that question, why does this even matter to us as believers and why does it matter to us as leaders? Well, the easy application is first to leaders. In the church, we must go through the process of choosing leaders, elevating people as leaders, whether they're Sunday school teachers, uh, small group leaders, deacons, elders, whatever they are, we need to do more than just rest on their resume of they know how to get things done and they have a really good education. That is not the first primary thing we need to look at. What we need to look at first is what is your relationship like with the Lord? How would you describe your relationship with the Lord? How has the Lord changed you in the past six months? What is the Lord teaching you in your devotion time with him? We have to ask that question of our leaders. We have to ask the, that question of the people that we put in leadership. But the second application that we want, that I want to bring up, is there's an application to us just as believers in Jesus Christ. And the question is this, do the qualities that show up in your life, do they glorify the Lord? We need to ask that question of ourselves. We need to ask ourselves, are my motives pure in this relationship that I have? Am I honoring God on Sunday morning and throughout the week, or am I doing it to be seen? We need to ask this question of ourselves as believers in Jesus Christ, do the qualities that are showing up in my life to other people, do they honor the Lord? And I encourage you to sit down sometime today, maybe even sometime this week, sit down with a Bible, a notebook, and a piece of paper and ask yourself the question, what qualities in my life honor the Lord? What qualities in my life don't honor the Lord? And when you sit there, pray over them and say, thank you for, for, for these qualities that you have given me the gift to honor you and, and help me, change me from the inside out that I would honor you in these ways. The last question that we have to ask is simply this. Does, this. does this person preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? The last woe, verse 52, Jesus looks at, at, at the scribes, he looks at the interpreters of the law, and he says, you, he says, woe to you, you have taken away the key of knowledge of God. You have not entered, and you are hindering people or preventing people from entering in. And what he's talking about is he's, talk, he's talking about the kingdom of God. You are preventing people from entering, entering in. You are preventing people from, from coming in contact with the very one who has the knowledge that leads to eternal life. And that is salvation in Jesus Christ. And so what these men are doing, Jesus is calling out these men because they're preaching a false, they're, they're teaching a false gospel. And they have a false message with false motives and their trust, they want you to trust in a false savior and that savior is you. And God's word is clear. In Ephesians 2, we are saved by grace through faith and it is not a result of our works so that no man can boast. And even, even as we go, as we think about that, as we drill down on that, we have the words of Christ in Matthew 11, verse 28, where people who have been kind of beaten down by performance and trying to do their best and legalistically hold to these commands, to their do's and don'ts that have been given to them, and they want to achieve that closeness with God. The desire is there, and yet God says through Jesus Christ, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Jesus is inviting us today not into a relationship that is defined, I'm not into rules that is a religion of rules, but into a relationship, which is why in Exodus 20, he starts in Exodus 20, verse 1, he says, I am the Lord your God. I'm the one who led you out 
of slavery, out of the house of Egypt, I've redeemed you. And then he says obey. It's about a relationship first and then obedience. And Jesus is saying, is he, he's inviting us into that relationship. So again, where, where's the application? Why does this matter to believers? Why does this matter to leaders? And simply this, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are commanded by God in Matthew 28 to go out and make disciples of all nations. So we need to ensure as believers in Jesus Christ that the message coming from our lips and from our lives is one that, that promotes the gospel of Jesus Christ and not our, our self-indulgence or our greed. The second application is to our job as leaders. Our job as leaders, Martin and myself, people who lead the choir, the choir, anyone who stands up front, what is our main purpose? Our main purpose is not to glorify ourselves. Our main purpose is not to make the message about ourselves. Our main purpose is that we must lift high the name of Jesus Christ. We must lift him high for the sole purpose of worship. That we would all fall down and worship at the sight of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. And if we veer from that, then we need to be held accountable. But our main goal is to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and one of the ways that we do that is what we are about to do. It is through the sacrament of communion. And as one person says, it is the gospel without words. One way that we lift up Christ is by taking the, the bread and the cup and communing with him together as his people. So, as we prepare our hearts, let me pray, and we'll, uh, we'll begin that. Almighty God, we thank you for being with us today. We ask that you would continue to move in our hearts and our minds as we prepare our hearts to eat the bread and to take the cup. Change us from the inside out. Make us new and awake our souls that we would live our lives on fire for you, and may the words of our mouths and our actions be in line together that the name of Christ is lifted up. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.